Okay, I think sort of um, the idea with the final panel is also to wrap up some of the themes of the discussion. We haven't been given any particular mandate or title, but the way we agreed with the with the panelists was that I would raise a few questions that I've sort of found interesting in the discussions, maybe bringing also together some of the, the uh, discussions today. And then I would give the floor to each of the three people because uh, I'm sure they've got something to say after hearing all the discussion today, which may also go a bit beyond what they were talking about earlier. And then would also open uh, the floor for uh, any comments. I know that Christine at least has one question that she wants to uh, wants to ask. I was trying to put to get you were trying to on them exactly. right there, but I, was, no, but I cannot be influenced. I'm independent. <laughs> So you get to raise your own questions, but I think sort of I would start with the with the elephant in the room, maybe, which I think has come up quite a few times, which is the question of politicization of expertise, which of course Thomas was uh, talking about specifically, but it really has come up in quite a lot of the discussions, and it's somehow, I mean, you were saying, uh, and I agree that you know we we approach the question of politicization in different ways sometimes it's considered a very good thing and other times it's considered an extremely bad thing uh, and this was also uh, a question that i remember christina uh, raised in relation to my uh, my talk and i actually also partly forgot uh, to reply but i think there is a good question in there about what do we mean by politicization of expertise does it mean that about the sort of the uses that uh, expertise is used for politi politicized ends, because of course it's used for politicized ends all the time, uh, and EU policy making is an act of politics. Uh, so that is in a way a little bit difficult to avoid. But then of course there's also the question of the politicization of the expert, which may be the more sensitive question and, and sort of becomes also, I think, a sensitive issue to even to do research on, because the claim that somebody as an expert is politicized is something that we also as experts are very sensitive to. And this is of course, and this is where I come to the reply that I forgot to, to give to Christina. This is an argument that legal experts in the institutions host all the time. And this is the, the argument that they uh, raise in to defend confidentiality of their advice because they say it has to be confidential uh, because otherwise there is a risk that the advice would become politicized. And I think even there, you can approach that also from the exact opposite perspective, saying, in my view, you know, your chances of remaining independent actually within your own institutions might actually be stronger <laughs> if what the advice that you give would be externally scrutinized. And it might actually defend your uh, expertise uh, and make possible political biases more visible. So I think that's one question that I would still want you to come back to the question of politicization of experts and expertise and how you feel about that. Then another issue, uh, which um, we also had, had a chat about with uh, Vigilenza uh, during the, the coffee break or the lunch break, is in a way the, the change in the EU that of course, you know, all of many of the models of decision making that the EU has sort of traditionally relied on are the ones on relying very much on the technocratic model and the administrative state and so forth. But I think Anik, for example, was talking about how the EU increasingly reaches beyond regulatory issues to issues of free distribution. We all know that, you know, the EU takes decisions every day that influence our daily lives. Um, and I would argue that in a way, the way we've approached experts um, is somehow really sort of becoming old fashioned because there's a lot of reliance on the sort of output legitimacy sources that, you know, it doesn't matter how we produce the sausage as long as the sausage is good. The sausage factory argument. Uh, and I'm just wondering whether sort of that the fact that the EU has become so strong <laughs> and a sort of such an actor in our daily lives would actually also force us to think about expertise in, in new ways and also the procedural parts, which uh, Maria was uh, talking about. And then a final question I was thinking, the, the whole theme of the, the, the workshop was also democracy in crisis and the sort of challenges to democracy. 
So I'm also wondering how should legal or experts in general, legal experts, other types of experts, also respond to the challenges of the EU? And does the factor that there are supposed to be experts and independent actually mean that this context should not uh, play a role <laughs> in, in how they do their work? Or how do you see the context affecting uh, experts and, and, their, uh, and their work? Um, so, I mean, feel free to discuss these questions. And also, if you have other things that you wanted to raise, now would be a good time. Who wants to start? Maria? <laughs> um, I'll go in reverse. Um, yeah. Democracy in crisis. Um, I think Maria said, didn't she, that it's not just EU democracy that, that's in crisis. Mm. I, I'd even say the EU is in less of a democratic crisis than a lot of other mm. places because it's not sort of retreating. It's simply observing um, more sharply the challenges that it does face. And the question, I, I think the question was, as experts, as academics, should we respond to the idea that democracy is in crisis? Well, yes, of course, I think. Mm. Um, and certainly when we watch the efforts of the UK to more or less democratically try to respond to the self-imposed crisis of Brexit, mm. the idea that we, the idea that it would be neutral not to mention the democratic challenges that we face makes no sense to me. I'm sure there are people out there doing that, but I think they have a particular perspective on those challenges. So, of course, we talk about democracy and norms and values. Um, changing the EU from technocratic towards more redistributive. I'm not sure it's a change. I wonder again whether we're just noticing it more. Mm. And there is something quite interesting, isn't there? That we think it's important to... Um, talk about things that we have been able to ignore for several decades and I'm forgetting what the um, it, it, we talked about we used to talk about an elite consensus didn't we mm -hmm. around the EU and that elite consensus sort of crumbled um, around the referenda on Maastricht and beyond and that we had to start paying attention to non-elites mm -hmm. and their understandings of what's happening in the European Union. And I wonder whether the shocks from non-elite engagement in the last couple mm -hmm. of decades is what's making us have this conversation. And um, this point about politicization of expertise, though, I think, as, as you suggest, Pivy, that expertise is political and that it just is and that is simply that is simply the way we have to work in the world and I think your idea of talking about experts is 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 a, is a useful one the way I would say is that you know we're not worried really about politics because politics is inevitable everybody is shaped by their worldview I'm shaped by my worldview and so is what I say um we're worried we're worried about bias and we're worried about corruption and I think, I think that it's when there's a systemic bias, so not about individuals, but a systemic bias, that's the issue. And that's one of the things that I wanted to sort of pick up and throw out in the final session, which is that, you know, the idea that political decision makers prefer technical reasoning in their decisions is really well established. It's established in all jurisdictions across all subject matters. I wonder whether legal expertise affects mm. that. Says, well, you'll be much safer mm. if you use numbers rather than mm. people don't like it. Mm. So there's, there's a preference for expertise. But systematically, and we've touched on it, systematically that, um, that prefers economic actors because economic actors have the resources and the concentrated interests to invest in expertise. Mm. Civil society lacks the resource and it's got diffuse interests. So there's less investment in the expertise. So, you know, we're, we're very familiar with ideas that expertise can be shallow, it can miss numbers, it can be reductionist. All of those things are true and it is worth continuing to say them. But I do think this idea of a systematic preference for an economic actor worldview 
is part of the story of our concern about the dominance of expertise. Mm -hmm. Lots more I can say about that, but I won't. <laughs> we, we need to talk to other people. Okay. Maria okay. or Martha? I can go. <clears throat> Yeah, thanks, um, Ivy. Um, I have a couple of things to say, but let me start with, with one that I find quite important. And maybe it's something that's um, assumed among us, but, but I feel the need to, to articulate it. And it's, it's that I would like to reframe slightly uh, the problem that we are discussing mm -hmm. here. Because the way that we, I, I felt the tendency in our discussion today has been to look at expertise as potential threat to democracy. And I, I, I don't think that that is helpful for our discussion because what we actually mean is something else. Uh, and I like this notion of, um, notion that uh, Catherine Holst, uh, has been using, uh, which speaks about the fact of expertise. Let's start with the fact of expertise, by which she means reliance on specialized expertise is unavoidable, is a fact of every modern complex democracy. And we wouldn't want to have to live in a system which doesn't do that, right? So um, it's a fact. And in a way, it's also democratic to use expertise for collective decision-making because you don't have collective self-determination mm -hmm. if you're not trying to, if you're not achieving solutions to collective problems, considering the, 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 the expertise, the evidence that is needed to solve collective problems. You're not going to solve climate emergency without mm -hmm. science. So in a way, of course it's output legitimacy, but it's, you know, no matter what kind of political theory you rely on, you need uh, expertise has a democratic function. It's not a democratic process of knowledge production, but it has a democratic function the same way that courts, although not being democratic, are, have an essential democratic function in our constitutional systems. So some people speak about this idea of effective trade control that we need in democracies. So, and of course, this is why when we speak about what a good government is, we can distinguish several bases of legitimation of good government. So we have as one legitimate thing, one way to justify government is to rely on expertise. Another one is to rely on representation. Another one is to rely on rule of law, et cetera, et cetera, accountability mechanisms. So there's, if you were talking about discourse of justification or discourse of legitimation, expertise is a valid basis among others. And some people would say that good government means that multiple bases of legitimation must be present. And it's ideally, you know, you, you ideally, if you strengthen one, it doesn't come at the cost of others. So there's not necessarily a trade-off, although maybe there is, we can talk about this. But ideally, if we're thinking about the EU, if, if we're assuming, assuming for a moment that the EU is quite, quite good with using expertise as justification for, for its decision-making, but maybe it's not very good at using other ways of justifying its decision-making. Maybe the weakness, the problem is not the strength of expertise, but the weakness mm -hmm. of the other basis of legitimation. So basically, I've, for a long time, I have been convinced that the EU suffers from a political deficit and that is the cause mm -hmm. of the problem and the reliance, the, the technocracy and the reliance on expertise is a symptom not the cause. Um, so if, but again, we could, we could think and we must think whether sometimes, you know, relying too much on technocratic arguments comes at the cost of other uh, ways to legitimize the EU and there might be trade-offs, but I think that is more kind of a case uh, by case 
examination rather than statement that we can make this level of generality. And so um, where does this leave me? Well, I'd like to scale this discussion down a little bit because I would like to get a little bit more uh, concrete. What I'm interested in is not so much uh, in looking at expertise as a problem, but in fact, thinking about the institutional mechanisms that would allow us to ensure a uh, productive interplay between expertise and law and politics. And so here I'm turning to institutions. And I think that is, that is, a, that is what's lacking. We have institutions, sorry, not that institutions are lacking, but we need to do more work to, to innovate these institutions. And I think we are agreeing on the problem analysis, but we need to do more work at looking at what actually, uh, how to, to um, improve imperfect institutions. Um, so there is this, um, this work I came across recently um, by a couple of political scientists, two of them from Australia, who have written a book um, on democratic mending, and who really focused, just like Maria did in her talk today, where she says, you know, democratic democracy happens at these micro levels of routine decision making, and this is this is this is where important things happen. And so this idea of democratic mending is something where is, is a, they define it as a novel way of conceptualizing how policymakers can improve democracy through everyday action within the boundaries of day-to-day -day jobs and where public, um, public authorities act by way of, in a similar way as healers, identifying systemic weaknesses in their interaction with their communities and with uh, affected actors, so that's awareness about the imperfection of our institutions, and at the same time create through daily practices uh, of mending ways of involving those who are who have experienced unfair, unjust outcomes and feel disconnected. And I think this kind of incremental small scale work is what we should be studying. And we can, I should stop now. I think I'm talking for for too long, but we can we can engage in a conversation about what kind of institutional mechanisms we already have at EU level that are trying to address the kind of shortcomings that we have been talking about here today related to expertise and expert decision-making. We can talk about courts, we can talk about stakeholder consultation, we can talk about the European Ombudsman, we can talk, you know, we can, we can talk about a range of mechanisms and we can talk about what's wrong with them, what's not good enough yet. And I think that would be the interesting discussion to have. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, uh, I mean, I was also trying to take a bit of a more positive uh, view on this issue of uh, expertise and the practice of people making. And I was wondering to what extent, maybe that's a bit optimistic, but uh, we could maybe try to see this moment of a bit contestation and also crisis kind of, of expert legitimacy as also a moment of a bit coming of age of EU democracy in a way. So we, we know that we are very much aware and it has been stuck quite extensively how the EU has from the beginning kind of got a good part of it, its legitimacy from the output side and from the problem solving capacity thanks to its claim to expertise and how this has also been used, again, as Maria was saying, as justification. So very often there has been a sort of application by political actors to take up fully their role and uh, outsourcing or delegating explicitly or implicitly to expertise. And, and this has shown all its limits in a way. So I'm wondering to what extent we could really see this, this moment of friction in a way of uh, discontent also as an occasion to also rethink what we, what, what is the place and the new place of expertise in, uh, in EU decision, in EU policy making, and in, in EU democracy. And I'm thinking that uh, <coughs> I think how I would like to see expertise in, in, a, in a democracy, in a um, supranational democracy, I'm then thinking that this could probably have the, the solutions which are largely, largely institutional would have to come from two sides. And one would probably be, relates to having a realistic view of 
what is expert so who are the experts and potentially also who sir who we appoint who we who we conceive of as experts so we have I was also mentioning before the role of hope that often economic actors have the advantage economic actors from being experts and similarly the way in which citizen science or like more lay forms of expertise like ex like more experiential expertise let's say uh, is not considered as expertise very often so shall we should this new place of expertise also account for forms of knowledge that do not ne not necessarily fit in the the way we think about expertise now so maybe this could be a way of reimagining what's what the place of expertise can be and another issue that i think should be taken into account is that of obviously of complexity because the reason i mean i would say the main obstacle to having a an, an normalized place of expertise in democracy is precisely this difficulty in holding them to account and obviously this incommunicability in a way between expertise and, and people and citizens and i think that there like one institution that has basically never been mentioned today is the european parliament and parliaments in general and i'm wondering also a bit in the separation of powers kind of strand of thinking could maybe could maybe parliaments also be thought in this vein or their role be um, also reimagined as translators of complexity in a way and i think we're very used to seeing parliaments as inadequate to take up this role but if we look a bit more in the long run historically parliaments have been developing in-house expertise quite significantly not on both the european parliament and national parliaments but there is parliaments parliaments are aware of this and they have been making an institutional effort to again develop their own in-house expertise to other expertise from external sources so obviously we can't expect that parliaments will be able to hold to account all experts on all fronts but i think they should also not be entirely discarded because we talked about events as avenues for to contest or hold experts to account and of course i mean i think i mean obviously courts have limits but i think there's also potential in this of course uh, but i i wonder whether parliaments could also have really this this role as translators in the sense that they have the visibility, they have the transparency potential, and they have the democratic legitimacy credentials mm -hmm. that no one else has. So uh, I'm wondering why we're maybe a bit uh, neglecting this mm -hmm. structure. Okay. So yeah, maybe, well, just one example on this front is the, the glyphosate case that Maria knows well. And here we have seen the European Parliament, we have seen a number of accountability initiatives being activated from citizens initiatives to the Ombudsman to courts, to the European Parliament establishing a special committee to actually go very much into the science of this. And I think Obviously, we can't expect that this happens every time, but also it can happen again. So I'm wondering to what extent this could be one way to, to address, to rethink a bit what's this place of expertise um, today. I forgot to mention a point. Yeah. So now, I think it's not surprising that we see politicization can be bad or good, because I do think there there are these two ways that politicization can play out. There is good politicization, there's bad politicization. And so the some of the good things that can that politicization can achieve is a it can indicate that the decision making structures in place are not adequate to the problem, or that that's, that issues are being framed in a way that doesn't correspond to people affected on the ground. So GMO regulation in the EU is a wonderful example. Glyphosate is another example. Politicization has kind of broken down broken down um, structures that have failed to incorporate the full breadth of issues at stake. So that, that was a positive effect, I think. Mm -hmm. Now, the second positive effect, there is there are studies in, in, in public acceptance research which actually show that the EU, um, particularly actors like the Commission, once an issue is politicized in the public debate, so mostly civil society is sort of bringing something up and is criticizing the Commission for doing something, the Commission tends to be very responsive. 
to, um, to citizen preferences once it feels that there's politicization. So it can act as a mechanism triggering democratic responsiveness without, you know, without the other um, uh, democratic. So it's not, it's not a classical type of democratic responsiveness. It's a new type where the commission is prompted by politicization to be more responsive. But of course, politicization can entrench, and that is that is the that is the major risk, I think, because we need we need a system in place in the EU where um, a discussion remains possible and a revision of previous standpoints remains possible, and alternatives can be reconsidered and considered again. And and I think that when when politicization is closing down debate uh, and is making things more entrenched, then that is problem but it is not it, it depends mm. it depends yeah.